Okay, so I'm here to introduce John. Um, John's been an MFT for over 30 years. And he's the author of the newly released Dancing with Fire, A Mindful Way to Loving Relationships. His other books include The Authentic Heart and Love and Betrayal. He co-authored a chapter with Susan Johnson on EFT and Buddhism in the Emotionally Focused Casebook. He has conducted workshops internationally, relationships and couples. He has conducted workshops internationally, relationships and couple on couple relationships and couples therapy, and is an adjunct fa faculty member of Meridian University. And he has a table with his books, so please see him after, and he'll be happy to talk to you about them. Welcome, John. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Wow. Well, I'm always nervous before I give a talk like this, so be nice to me, please. <laughs> so people are interested in Buddhism and really, and mindfulness? Boy, that's a real change from many years ago when I first got interested in it, which was, boy, I was in college in the late 60s. I had a teacher from India talking about Buddhism. He brought some of his books that he translated, the Dhammapada and uh, his hin Hindu books. He was a Hindu man, but he was very interested in Buddhism. So I was really lucky to be introduced when I was like 19 or 20 into Buddhism. And then I lived in the New York Zen Center in Manhattan back in 1974. So that was a good introduction, although it wasn't that satisfying because nobody was into feelings back then who, who were in the Buddhist world. So I was also lucky when I was in college, I was in what's called the sensitivity group. Any of you remember that? Oh, really? Any of you involved in that back then? Yeah, it was, it was so, I was kind of on, this, on these two tracks. One was the sensitivity groups, and I finally got introduced to what a feeling was. <laughs> I never knew what feelings were. But I was also interested in Buddhism and meditation. And I would ask them of the Buddhist teachers about feelings, and they, would, they wouldn't know what I'm talking about. And I would talk to some of the feelings people in the sensitivity group about meditation, and they thought those people were navel gazers, just self-absorbed narcissistic people who were kind of crazy. So I was kind of never fully comfortable in the Buddhist world and never fully comfortable with the feelings crowd. So then I went to Naropa Institute in like 1974. Any of you ever go to, to Naropa? Yeah, you know about it. And so Trungpa Rinpoche was there, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. Ram Das was there. And Ram Dass set up two people to teach a meditation class. Those people were Jack Hornfield and Joseph Goldstein. So they were just getting their start teaching, so I was fortunate to be in their, in their course. And again, I would ask them questions about feelings, and they, they weren't very good either at that time, <laughs> talking about feelings, right? So I wasn't fully comfortable still in the Buddhist world, but I valued the meditation, so I did that and, and still do it. Um, they've come a long way by the way, since those days, in terms of opening to feelings. So that's, that's encouraging. So I've been really interested in this interface for, you know, for like for over 40 years now. Um, and I've been an MFT for like 34 years now. So I've really been interested in how to, how to integrate these two. So I find oftentimes people who come into the office, maybe you found this too, they, they say they're having a communication problem when couples come in. And, and often that's true, they're having a communication problem, but more fundamentally what I'm finding is they're actually having a self-awareness problem. Like they're not really aware of what they're experiencing. You know, they might communicate their blame and their anger and their criticism and think they're great communicators. You know, I, I'm a good communicator, I can tell you exactly what's wrong with you. <laughs> I don't have trouble communicating that to you. But they're not uncovering what's really underlying that. They're aware of the tip of the iceberg, but they're not aware of, of their vulnerable feelings, their fears, their shame, their sadness, their, their longings, longings for connection. So they're not very adept at, and that, this doesn't apply to any of us, of course. We're talking about our clients, right? <laughs> but, but they're not very adept at uncovering the more vulnerable feelings inside and conveying that to to people they want to be close to. So what we're really talking about here is, is cultivating mindfulness, being mindful, being a, it's a simple word for non-judgmental awareness of what we're actually experiencing inside. 
connecting with what we're actually experiencing. So there's a term for this when people are not a, people who are on a spiritual path, and probably a lot, a lot of your clients or some of your clients are interested in meditation and Buddhism and spirituality. You have people like that come into your office, and maybe they're very attached to their meditation practice, but but they're doing they do. There's a term for this now for people who are into spiritual practice, but they're not opening to their feelings and their longings. Do you know what that term is? Right, right. Spiritual bypassing. And so, and John Wellwood coined that word. So, so I, went to, I came out here to California from New York to go to the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto, which is now called Sophia University. And, and I did my doctoral dissertation on the complementary effects of focusing, which I'll talk about later, some of you know focusing, and meditation. And John Wellwood was my dissertation advisor back like in the late 70s. And, when I was writing this. So I got exposed then to focusing the importance of really integrating our feelings. This is before the word spiritual bypassing was, was created. But this is what, what my interest has been for many years. There's another term for it that people you probably haven't heard of, Peter Campbell and Ed McMahon. They're actually Catholic priests, long-term teachers of focusing. Ed just died a few months ago at the age of like 86. And they, they use a term called process skipping. Like it's skipping over people's process, which, which I prefer, actually. I really like that term. People doing this process skipping. They're not opening to their inner process, their inner feelings. They're trying to get to some place they consider spiritual, but they're skipping over what they're actually experiencing inside and, and judging that experience. So I have a quote here from Jack Cornfield. He's one of my favorite teachers. And this quote's in my, my latest book, by the way, Dancing with Fire. And by the way, just a commercial before I forget to mention it. I'm, I'm selling that book for $10 to, to, today, which is my cost. It's usually $16.95 plus tax, but I just want to get it out there. So if you want it, I'm happy to sign it and make it available. I spent 10 years working on, on that book. Actually, 40 years thinking about it. <laughs> but 10 years actually writing it. So it's kind of my precious baby that came out not long ago, just about eight months ago. So this is a great quote from Jack. He's, he's very courageous to, to write about this in one of his books. He said, meditation has helped me very little with my human relationships. I could do loving kindness meditation for a thousand beings elsewhere, but I had trouble relating intimately to one person here and now. I had used the strength of my mind in meditation to suppress painful feelings. And all too often, I didn't, didn't even recognize when I was angry, sad, grieving, frustrated until a long time later. The roots of my unhappiness in relationships had not been examined. I had very few skills for dealing with my feelings or for engaging on an emotional level or for living wisely with my friends and loved ones. Isn't that a great, that's a great acknowledgement, isn't it? And that's in a path with heart. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, awareness doesn't translate automatically from one realm to another. You can be extremely conscious of your body. Maybe you know people with this. It's really connected to their body, but still be emotionally ignorant. This is Jack talking, right? You can have a great deal of emotional understanding and still be spiritually bereft. I've known dozens of meditators who can go completely empty in meditation, dissolve their bodies and mind into pure bliss, but then come back in the world and still act like emotional infants and sexual idiots in their relationships. <laughs> okay. <You know. laughs> so in my view, they've only done half the dharma, says Jack. They've only done half the practice. There has to be a wedding of the personal and the universal. So I'm going to tell you a, a story, that, that we'll talk about that. This, this story is in my book, too, Dancing with Fire. This is a Zen story. Uh, there's an older woman who supported this monk for 20 years. She built a hut for him. She would bring him food every day. And then one day, she was wondering about how much spiritual progress he had made. So she set up this, this scheme. She sent this beautiful woman who was, quote unquote, rich in desire to visit this monk and to begin to caress him and then ask what his, and see what his response was. So the young woman went up to the monk, she starts stroking him, and then she asks, how do you feel? This is like every monk's worst nightmare, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So the monk was very stiff and he said, I feel like a withering tree on a rock in winter, totally without warmth. I feel like a withering tree on a rock in winter, totally without warmth. Not a good line to memorize when you're with your, your partner, <laughs> when they ask you how you feel after they've kissed you. <laughs> not, not suggested. So when the word got back to the older woman about, about his response, she was very upset. And she proceeded, she concluded that he was a fake, and she proceeded to burn down his hut and evict him. Van Zen's story is always very dramatic, <laughs> very dramatic. <laughs> but, the, but the moral of the story, as I understand it, like it's kind of a metaphor, that this is a man who was in, his spiritual practice was not only to not have feelings, and not only to suppress his desires, but, but not, even to, not even to experience them anymore like a withering tree on a rock. He doesn't even experience desire anymore. To him, that's the epitome of spiritual practice, to transcend his longings, to transcend his desires, right? But the woman wasn't buying it. The older woman wasn't buying it. She was upset that he didn't at least show kindness to the, to the, to the young woman who visited him. And we might see it as a, as a, as a metaphor for when we suppress our desires, they come back with a vengeance. They get, they get buried underground, and they come, they come back to burn us, right? Like this monk was not good at dancing with fire. He was good at suppressing his emotions, suppressing his longings and the fire within him. So another way to say this is the monk was very attached. He's, he's practicing non-attachment, right? But he's very attached to non-attachment, right? It's really tricky. You know, in the Buddhist world, in the spiritual world, it's so easy to misunderstand spiritual teachings. And now we get attached to something that's quite different. Than what, and, and it just doesn't work to be attached to non-attachment. What works is to be open to experiencing what is from moment to moment. That's really what the path is about. So the healthy alternative to pursuing a path that bypasses feelings and bypasses along is to welcome our humanity just as it is. So, and I have a quote from my book that I'll read to you which describes this. Spiritual awakening is not synonymous with the, sense, with the cessation of desire, emotional shutdown, or icy withdrawal. We deny our need for bonded relationships at our own peril. There's no escaping life and the longings that are hinged to it. Life invites us to give desire its proper due and engage with it in ways that nourish us rather than sabotage us. So that's, the, that's to me, that's the heart of the spiritual path, to really open to what we're experiencing from moment to moment. The Zen teacher Joko Beck puts it nicely. She says, enlightened, to be awake is to be, she says, she says, who we are is simply experiencing itself. Who we are is simply a being who experiences things. We need to just open to our experiencing. That's the path toward awakening. Now, not to bog you down in too many Buddhist details, but, but there's a term in Pali called tanha. It's T-A-N-H-A, -A, tanha. T -A -N. And it's often translated as desire, and, and, and often understood as desire being the root of suffering. But the real, the real translation for tanha is really craving. It's like clinging so tightly. In psychological terms, it would be kind of like addiction or compulsion, like clinging so tightly to things, like clinging to our judgments of other people, for example or clinging to our criticism of ourself. And that, that holding on, that clinging, that craving is what causes suffering, not, not desire itself. Desire is just how we're wired. We're wired with longings. So we need to open to that and work with that. And, and if you have an understanding of this with clients who are, who are kind of misunderstanding Buddhism, you, mean you don't want to have debates about what Buddhism actually means, but maybe if you understand a little bit about what Buddhism really is, you can gently invite people to consider an alternative understanding, which, which might help them. Okay. So, oh, do you want to ask? Yeah, I think that would be good. Yeah, thanks. So deeper connections unfold as we learn how to be just more relaxed with what we're experiencing inside, just more connected, more relaxed inside with ourselves. And, you know, meditation, and some of you have a meditation practice that you do? Yeah. You know, meditation practice, mindfulness practice can just kind of help us 
relax not by suppressing what we're feeling, but by opening to what we're experiencing and not denying it or avoiding it, just merely being gentle, gently connected to what we're feeling. And then we can carry that into relationships. Because, you know, the, the ways we often communicate in relationships are the ways that John Gottman talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Remember what those four things are? Criticism, stonewalling, contempt, and defensiveness. Right, right. I knew we'd come up with that. So those are the ways people often communicate. And what's the antidote to that? Well, to me, the antidote to, to communicating that way is to uncover what we're actually experiencing beneath those things. There's, there's something more vulnerable, something more tender, some feelings, desires, longings that we're not in touch with. Or if we are in touch with them, we're not doing a very good job of conveying that, of revealing that to the other person, which would then invite them toward us. So often we get so attached to and clinging to wanting to control we want love and connection so badly that we end up trying to control the other person. And if we can just shake them and criticize them, they'll finally wake up and give us what we need, right? That works, that works all the time, doesn't it? It works very well, right? So instead, we have to kind of be mindfulness, and it's kind of a spiritual approach to relationships, allows connection to come through the back door, not the front door. So in other words, if we can create a climate where someone's more likely to want to come toward us, that's, that, that's, very, that's very powerful. And the way to create the climate is to, be, is to reveal in a tender, gentle way what we're actually experiencing inside. And mindfulness helps us do that. In a, in a little bit, we're going to actually do a, little bit of, do a little scripted role play. I've got a couple of uh, volunteer actors here who are going to help the, demonstrate some of these points. So we'll have a more graphic display of this. But let's see if there's anything else. OK, did you want to ask a question, Mira? Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in this because it feels like what some of us struggle with ongoingly in life, you know, this balance between our, our feelings and our heart and then and spiritual longings. And I'm interested, are you actually then saying that in your view, many, many people who over centuries practice spirituality really kind of got it wrong? You know, the monks who would go, I mean, you hear the story about the monk who, would, this always really bothered right, me, the right. one who would go to his cave and he got so mad that his, he had, his eyelids kept blinking that he you know, took off his eyelids. And I always like, this, these kinds of things would, would make me repelled because of the disconnection from the heart. So I'm really interested right. in Right, and, and, and there's a famous Zen story of a monk who was not accepted into the Zendo, and then he came back after having cut off his arm to show how committed he was to the practice. Right, right. You know, you know that story? Yeah, no, so there no, are no. kind of ugly stories like that. So I guess we could look at it two ways. Either some people weren't weren't quite understanding what Buddhism is really about, which is my preferred understanding of it. Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so easy to misinterpret anything, right? right. And we, our ego kind of appropriates it and uses it for egotistical reasons. Right. And we try to control it. And it's not really the deeper teaching. So I think there's a deeper teaching that some people, mm -hmm. I, like, I love Jack's writing, and other people write beautifully. And mm -hmm. Tara Brock, I really, yeah. you know, her, her work is really wonderful. Radical acceptance is really all about focusing. Just accepting our experience just as it is is the path. It's the Dalai Lama. Yeah, the Dalai Lama. I'm going to talk about him in a moment. Right. Yeah, he's one. He really embraces his humanity. One thing that he said that I liked. Cause I, he says, I, he said, I can be patient with children for short periods only. Yeah. <laughs> Man with no pretensions. He's just really authentic about how difficult it is. Right. So and and. Sorry? So it sounds like your answer is, which is actually reassuring to me. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people misunderstand okay. Buddha. And, I, and, I, you know, and I've been actually to Asia. I've been to Thailand like eight times, talking to monks there. One of them's reading my book, actually, and is liking it, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. He leads a thing called the Monk Chats in, in Chiang Mai, in one of the cities in Thailand. And after talking to monks, you know, you know, a lot of people, the way they practice Buddhism is like how people ca practice Catholicism in America. The way I grew up was Catholic. And it's, a lot of it's based on superstition. You know, like you send your, your 14, 13-year-old son to the monastery to become a monk, and you accumulate merit for that. You get merit. So it's good for your next life, if not this one. And the monks, you know, they, they're very traditional. You know, they don't, well, obviously, they don't believe in abortion, but they don't even believe in birth control, which the Dalai Lama does. I sent a link to the Dalai Lama's view on birth control to, to this monk. 
<laughs> trying to trying, trying to trying to convert him. <laughs> He said, well, I could be wrong, was his response. I might be wrong, but, that, but that's our view here in the monastery, right? So they're open. You know, some people are really open. I think slowly it's changing. I think Buddhism's come to the West. This is the exciting thing. And, and through the West, I think it's kind of coming back to the East in ways that give them some fresh perspective on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh oh, is this the one giving me a hard time? Yeah, no, <laughs> she's the one giving oh, me a hard time. Okay? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but um, I'm just thinking to follow on this, wouldn't you, you know, can you just comment on the ideology that it's really human beings that are just being able to pull the two together, you know, that, that we haven't really had the, I mean, perhaps Aboriginal peoples did better, but for the most part, modern peoples haven't been able to pull together this idea of living in a world that's timeless and also living on the ground at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's what a lot of this yeah. is about, is how do you integrate? Yeah, you know, it's, really, it's so difficult, right? So we, we can't really right. expect anybody to have all the answers. You right, know, like the Buddhists just, in Asia yeah. have all the answers. It's very complex. So, right, it's, right. so it's up for each of us to try to uncover uncover this stuff and see what's, what's true. There's no, there's no like set teaching to follow. There's no authority to believe in around it. We, we really, and the Buddha said this too, which is beautiful, that we really need to listen to our own experience. You know, if, there's a famous Zen saying that I like, if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. Have you heard that expression? And my understanding is that if you, if you come across something that you think is the final teaching, you know, don't, you know, be suspicious of that. Have some healthy doubt and investigate it for, through your own experience. That's one thing I love about Buddhism. Just really listen to your own, your own inner wisdom. Okay, so in our attempt to be a spiritual, or in our attempt to be a good Buddhist, we often subtly bypass these unpleasant, uncomfortable, inconvenient feelings that we're having inside, right? And when we turn our awareness away from these uncomfortable feelings, something inside us begins to shut down. You know, we, we tend to withdraw from people when we're not connected to our actual experience. Um, and, and we don't really then listen to people. It's difficult to listen to others when we're not really listening and being attentive to our own experience. There's a great saying, a quote that's also in my book from Douglas Steer. He's a Quaker. He talks about the, the, the power of listening. I really love this quote. He, he calls it holy listening. You know, we do this right in our work. We really listen. It's so powerful. Just listen to people it's amazing. without judging them. Holy listening to listen another's soul into life, into a condition of disclosure and discovery, may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. This is on the, on the handout also, this quote. So you don't have, don't have to write it down. It's on my handout. Um, holy listening, to listen another soul into life. Listening another soul into life, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service that you, any human being ever performs for another. Did you say you have a yeah, that's on my handout, it's on the table. I've got four handouts. So I think there's still, yeah, but there's still left. Now this, now this is kind of similar, to in, in, Thai, in Thailand, in the Thai language, there's, a, there's an expression, kao jai means I understand, kao jai. And jai means heart, and kao means to enter. It's like when I understand you, I'm entering your heart. Isn't that beautiful? How do you spell it? Um, the, the way I spell it is K-H-A-O, and the new word J-A-I. It means I understand. We understand another person by entering their heart. Okay, so we're going to one o'clock here, right? Okay. Okay, so either we shut, when we're not really connected, we sh either shut down or, or we tend to attack, judge, criticize, blame, accuse, analyze other people. So often what people do, have you noticed this with your couples, they share their perceptions about the other person. What's wrong with the other person? And I'll, and I'll sometimes say, that, well, that's a, I understand that's a perception you have, but, but what does it really feel like inside when you say that? What, what are you really experiencing? You know, the perception, you're selfish, you're lazy, you're, you, don't, you never listen, you're always looking out for yourself. These are all perceptions. They're not sharing the deeper ex felt experience. 
So I'm going to talk about focusing in a little while, which focusing is a, like a, is a mindfulness practice. You know, it's a practice of loving kindness with ourself. It's just really being gentle with our own experience and then learning how to share that with, some, with, with somebody else. Um, so here's another quote from Jack, because we were talking here about spiritual path, what it means to awaken, to... You know, a lot of people get in touch, a lot of people get seduced by this Buddhist concept of enlightenment. Like, people want to become enlightened. I mean, none of, none of us are ever, have ever done this, I'm sure. Like, although I have, I have to admit, I've, I've done this in the past, like, really trying to get enlightened and missing what's here right now. So Jack says, free is not free, this is in the, free is not free from feelings, but free to feel each one and let it move on, unafraid of the movement of life. This is in the handouts too, this quote. Free is not free from feelings, because people think freedom and awakening and light, I mean, it means, and this is in a lot of the traditional Buddhist texts, Mira, this, this belief that, it's a, it's, it's a lot of the translated in the text that when you're enlightened, you don't have any more fear, you don't have any more sorrows. You're, you're constantly in a steady state of calmness. And it's crazy making, right? Because then we want to try to get to this state. And we subtly bypass what we're really feeling inside. We skip over that part of our process. So Jack is trying to, Jack really understands this. He's trying to move it in a different direction. So he says, free is not free from feelings, but free to feel each one. And to move on unafraid of the movement of life. So to not be afraid of, to not have aversion toward our feelings. You know, in Buddhism, attachment and aversion are the two things that keep us stuck. But a lot of people who practice have an aversion to their feelings. They have an aversion to uncomfortable feelings inside of them. They have an aversion to their fears. They think they should not be afraid or shouldn't have any shame. And in such a subtle way, the ego kind of latches onto that and tries to be a person who doesn't have these kind of feelings. So whenever they come up, there's just a subtle way that they get dissociated from, right? And that's not the spiritual path. The path is not about dissociating. So here's a great story, one of my favorite Zen stories. One day it was announced by the master Joshu that the young monk Kyojin had reached an enlightened state. Much impressed by the news, several of his, of his peers went to him and said, we heard you have en- we've heard that you are enlightened. Is this true? It is, Kyojin said. Well, tell us, said a friend, how do you feel? The enlightened Kyojin replied, I feel as miserable as ever. <laughs> Now, here's a man who understands that enlightenment awakening doesn't mean we, don't, we no longer have pain or feelings. But the way we relate to the feelings changes. I mean, that's the key difference. We can be with them. We're not so afraid of them. We can open to them, acknowledge our humanity. So the Dalai Lama is someone who does a good job of, of acknowledging his, his humanity. And by the way, there's, a, there's another Zen teacher, Dogen, you've heard of him. <clears throat> he says, to enlightened is to be intimate with all things. To him, an awakening, enlightenment, it's about connection. This is a lot of what my Dancing with Fire book is about. That the path is really about connecting. That the root of suffering isn't, isn't getting attached so much as it is feeling isolated. To me, that's the main reason people are suffering. We're isolated. This is why attachment theory is so powerful and helpful. To integrate that into Buddhism is really what what I spent 10 years writing this book about, how to integrate attachment theory with Buddhism and the spiritual path. What causes suffering is this, the disconnection we feel from ourselves and from each other. This creates tremendous suffering in people's lives. So how do we get reconnected? How do we get reconnected by opening to what we're actually experiencing and honoring that? It's, it's actually, it's, it's very simple. Not easy, but simple. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> That's it. So Dogen says to be enlightened is to be intimate with all things. To be awake is to connect. Connect with ourselves, connect with each other, connect with nature. He was big on connecting with nature, so important. And Thomas Merton, you know Thomas Merton, the Christian monk who died tragically in Thailand many years ago. and He got electrocuted, but he was really working on this interface of East and West. He says, for me to be a saint means to be myself. Isn't that good? To be a saint means to be myself. It's very simple. 
Okay. So the Dalai Lama, he was asked by an interviewer, he was interviewed by a psychiatrist, maybe some of you have seen that book. Um, if there was, he was asked, is there anything in your life that you've regretted? And so he recounted the story of an older monk that came to him wanting to do this advanced esoteric practice. And the Dalai Lama listened and said, you know, that practice is really very rigorous. It's more appropriate for younger people. And the man went away, disappointed, killed himself because he wanted to come back reincarnated as a younger monk who could do this advanced practice. Not, not, not a good idea. So you never know. Maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's you. <laughs> so he was asked by the interviewer, well, how did you get rid of this feeling of regret? And how do you suppose he responded to that? He didn't get rid of it, exactly. He didn't get rid of it. But before he, um, but before he, he responded in that way, he paused for a long time before he said anything. He paused. You know, how did you get rid of this feeling of regret? So the Dalai Lama was focusing. And he was kind of going inside, taking his time, pausing. Pausing is a big thing in focusing. Just pa- and in spiritual practice, to pause. When it's, and he said, no, I didn't get rid of it. It's still there. Um, so this, this story, uh, one of the reasons I like this story is it's notable not just for what the Dalai Lama said, but for what the Dalai Lama didn't say. I mean, what, what, what could he have said, like if he had lived in California and was like into New Age philosophy, what might the Dalai Lama have said? I've learned to forgive myself, I've let it go. He asked for it. He created his own reality. <clears throat> I'm not responsible for his dis- for his reality. He smoked some dope and it went away. <laughs> right. How about um, everything's perfect just the way it is? That could have been another one. I have an article on this, by the way. I hope, hope some of you aren't mad at me after you read it. But it's, it's one of the handouts. I wrote it like 14 years ago. So if you don't like it, it's because I wrote it a long time ago. <laughs> and if you do like it, I'll take full credit and thank you very much. <laughs> it's, called, it's called Creating Your Reality or Fashioning Your Fantasy. Beyond, Beyond New Age Narcissism is the subtitle. I think it's a kind of a narcissistic belief. I mean, like a lot of things, there's some truth in it, of course, right? I mean, we, could, we participate in creating our reality. We make decisions. We have certain power to kind of co-create our reality with each other. So there's some truth in it. But anything that's true, like, like Buddhist teachings, can be misused for our own egotistical purposes. So anything that comes up that's uncomfortable, we don't have to feel it. Now we can just say, oh, everything's perfect the way it is. I mean, okay, maybe that helps people get through some difficult times. I don't want to... I don't want to uh, criticize that too much, maybe just a little bit. <laughs> but, it's, it, but is it true that you know, it gives us tremendous power? I mean, do we have that much power? Well, like to say we create our own reality, it kind of leads to the view that we don't affect each other. And it's, so it's, I think it's anti-relational, that view. Those views are kind of anti-relational. So be curious what you think of the article. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be. If it gives somebody some peace of mind and helps them feel more relaxed, you know, if it's, it's part of their self-soothing just to say, well, maybe there's a reason for this that I don't understand. I mean, that, it's not a horrible thing to believe that. But if people are using that to bypass their grief or their sorrow or their pain, then they don't share those feelings with each other anymore. You know, then we don't share our humanity with each other. We just kind of revert to our belief about life. Oh, everything's perfect the way it is. And it becomes like a rote way we respond to things instead of saying, oh, I feel really sad about that. I mean, the Dalai Lama felt sad. He felt badly that this person had gone, gone off to kill himself. And that's part of his humanity. And, and when he shared that, it made me feel like it's more okay for me to have my humanity. It's okay for me to have regrets, to have feelings, instead of having some belief like, you know, we shouldn't have any regrets in life, right? Right. Yeah. So there's another there's another story I like. Um, uh, one of the do you know uh, Martin Bu- Martin Buber? 
You, you like Martin Buber? Remember the book that he wrote? I and Thou, right, right. Where do I, where do I have him? So, Martin Buber, he, was, he had a similar story. He was visited by a young students when he was teaching at, at the university. And he was, he was busy meditating and praying. The man came in to talk about a problem he was having. And uh, he, he wasn't totally present and attentive. Later, he found out that this young man went out and killed himself. And so Martin Buber was gripped by this, this shame, this awful feeling of not having been fully attentive and present to this other human being who was suffering. And that was the pivotal moment that led Martin Buber to understand that spirituality is about our life of relationship with each other. It's not about transcending. It's not about having ecstatic experiences. It's about our connections with each other. So he went on to become a beautiful writer about the importance of, of connecting with each other. And he wrote that famous book, I and Now. And um, it's one that I, a lot of us read in college way back, right? In the, when was that? In like the early 70s? Okay. Late, late 70s, late, mid to late 70s, something like that. Right. So, so these are examples of spiritual teachers who, um, who understand, you know, and Carl Jung, you know, he says, we, not, we, we need to not adopt Eastern teachings wholesale, but integrate them into our culture, integrate them into our society. And the Dalai Lama talks about that as well. The Dalai Lama said, if science finds something that contradicts Buddhism, then Buddhism needs to change, not science. So this kind of speaks to Mira's point also. You know, if science finds something that contradicts Buddhism, then we need to change as Buddhists. And Buddhism has always changed, actually, when it's entered different cultures. This is kind of an exciting thing. When it entered China, it became a more family-friendly religion because China was all about family and connection. So I think now that it's entering the West, it's going to become more about how do we apply it to our relationships because we're wired for love. We're wired, we want, we want romantic love. We want connections. So how can Buddhism apply to our life of relationships? OK, I think it's getting time close where we should do this role play so we can demonstrate some of these ideas. But first, any other questions? Any comments at this point? John. John I, I'm interested in what seems to be a conflict. You, the, the, uh, Traveling in uh, the course of perfect understanding, it's discovered that all skandhas are empty. And one of the skandhas that's supposedly empty is feelings. Yet the way you're talking about feelings, which I completely accept, suggests that they are full, they are rather than empty. And I'm wondering how you. Uh, get these two things to relate to each other. Well, maybe one way to understand the idea, and I don't want to get too philosophical, but feelings are empty. One way we could understand that is if we can just, if they're empty, what are they empty of? Maybe they're empty of our interpretations about them and all the crazy things we do in our head around our feelings. <clears throat> if we can just simply be, if they're empty, maybe it means we just need to be with, just let them be. Experiencing them, experience them as they are, then they tend to pass. We don't cling to them. We don't hold on to them. They come, they go. It's so like it's real, as opposed to empty meaning unreal. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's my way to understand. And, and one one saying that kind of I like that describes it is we we can't control the waves, but we can learn how to surf. <laughs> so the feelings come, we be with them, we learn how to ride them, navigate them. It's like that's what it's like dancing with fire without getting burned. We go with what we're experiencing, let it come, let it go. Don't get so attached to it. Don't take it too personally. I think humor is a good thing too, as a side side comment, to not take ourselves too too seriously, because you know? that's part of what the empty the idea of emptiness not to take ourselves too seriously, not to take whatever comes. I mean, serious in a way, but in another way, have some perspective on it. And things come, and they. I mean, that's the Buddhist concept of anicca, impermanence. Things come and things pass, but they tend not to pass if we cling to them so tightly. But if we can just be with them in a gentle way, maybe they want to reveal more of themselves. You know, the, the way Buddhism used to be taught by Buddhist teachers in America is that when feelings would come, the teachers would say, well, just let them go. Just let them go. And then people like Jack began to catch on that while people were letting them go, they were just uh, they were dissociating from their feelings. So then they began to say, OK, just let them be. Just let the feelings be, which is an ad advanced advanced, more advanced practice. Let the feelings be as they are. 
But I think now we're kind of entering a phase where an, an even additional step would be helpful, which is let it unfold. Just kind of let the feelings unfold. I, I talk about this in my book also. And letting them unfold means maybe there's some meaning that the feelings have, where if we bypass them or process skip over them, we're not going to get the advantage of the meaning of the feelings. We'll see that demonstrated in a moment in this role play, that feelings can have different meanings, that they're connected to something that's important in our life. We don't want to quickly push it away, but it helps us understand ourselves better, helps us understand each other better, if we can open to that dimension. OK, so focusing. Um, so Eugene Genlin, who developed focusing, is some of you familiar with focusing? Yeah, OK, it's good stuff. You know, you know, Peter Levine borrows a lot from focusing, the trauma work. You're familiar? He uses the, uses the term felt sense comes from focusing, and he credits Genlin with that. And, and you know, Genlin didn't get a copyright for focusing when he developed it, because he just wanted people to use it. He wanted it to be freely available, which was very generous. So anybody can learn focusing, use focusing. There's training if people want to do more. There's an international conference in New York in May. If anyone's interested, I can tell you more about that. I'll be, I'll be do, doing, a, doing some workshops there. So Genlin was born in 1927, which makes him what? How old is he now? Um, he's like 87. He's 87. Is that right? And when he was 11, he, he, watched, he watched his father. He was born in Austria when Nazi Germany was coming in. Um, and um, he watched his father make intuitive choices, trusting one person but not another. And that enabled his family to escape the Nazis when many other families weren't so lucky. So, so Gene Genlin, he asked his father, well, Dad, how did you, how did you figure that out? How did, how did you know you could trust a particular person and not another? His father tapped into his chest and says, I follow my feeling. I follow my feeling. And that led Genlin to be really interested. Well, what is, what is that feeling that he followed and trusted? You know, and later he'd come to term it the felt sense. He trusted his felt sense about something. So, so Gene makes an important point that he didn't, he didn't invent focusing. He just observed it. He discovered it. He, he observed this is what people do. And the research on it is when people make progress in psychotherapy, this is what they're quite naturally doing. They're connecting with their felt sense. They're slowing down their speech. They're, they're breathing. They're taking time to go inside before they answer. And they get more connected to these fuzzy, vague, unclear feelings until they begin to come into focus. That's why he called it focusing. Gradually, these feelings come more into focus as you pause, give them space, honor them, not judge them, and hear what they're trying to tell you. And that's the way, the way things begin to move forward. OK, so here's the exciting part of the afternoon now. We're going to do this exciting role play. <laughs> and I'm hoping this will, do, will, will accomplish a couple of things. One, it'll give you some feeling for focusing and how to work with somebody using focusing. So it'll give you my, my feeling for how I would work with somebody. And I think it'll also give you kind of a sense of this unlayering that happens with focusing, where you be with what you're noticing, and then you give that space, and then something deeper has an opportunity to emerge or come, come, more, uh, come more into being. But before we do that, are there any other any, any questions or comments popping to mind? Angela? Thank you so much. This is really great to hear you. And I, I'm sitting here listening and just thinking about depression and you know places where um, there's such a cutoff from feeling and yeah. such a severe sense of a distance. Um, yeah. And just you know how you work with that. And how do I work with that? Yeah. Um, well, I th you know one thing I said to someone recently who was telling me how depressed he was. I don't, you know, it's such a clinical term. So, what, what do you mean by depressed? You know, and, uh, you know, what, what are you feeling when you say depressed? And and I, I try to help him a little bit find words that maybe would resonate. Well, do you feel sad sometimes? Or he said, yeah, maybe that's a better word. Sad. I feel sad. Oh, okay. Well, that's it's understandable. It's a you know, it's a normal human feeling to be sad about things. Uh, and then we kind of maybe went to, went to some of the things that he felt sad about. I'm, I'm trying to bring it to the felt. Ex what's the felt experience? But yeah, just but but yeah, clinically in general, people who are depressed, they're they're pushing down a lot of their emotions, a lot of their feelings. They're not maybe they have shame around them, and, and obviously there's a lot of history, good reasons why they suppressed all these painful, difficult feelings. So I think there again, listening is just helps somebody come in, come alive, just to, to really listen and make a connection over time, 
when somebody b gradually begins to feel safe to open to their actual felt experience and, and, not, and know they're not going to be judged or attacked by you, that you welcome that. That's, it's okay for them to feel what they feel, experience what they experience. Because I think a lot of depression is people become numb inside because it was too painful. Maybe there's been a lot of trauma too that needs to be worked with in a delicate way. Yeah. That, that,